Mike's on. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Jesse Proudman, IBM Distinguished Engineer and CTO of what's now called Bluemix Private Cloud. And introducing Animesh. Uh, I'm Animesh. I'm an architect for IBM Bluemix, platform as a service. So we're here to talk to you today about two of the IBM offerings, but not about the offerings themselves, specifically about what we've learned uh, through the operations of both uh, Bluemix, which is uh, Bluemix Platform as a Service, the Cloud Foundry uh, installation, and the Bluemix Private Cloud, which used to be the Blue Box OpenStack as a Service offering. Uh, at the OpenStack Summit in Austin, uh, Mark Collier uh, mentioned some of the stacks in terms of the workloads which are running on OpenStack. And followed by Kubernetes, uh, Cloud Foundry is the second most popular workload which is right now deployed on top of OpenStack. So what is Cloud Foundry for some of those? Uh, maybe one of the questions, how many here have used Cloud Foundry or have heard about Cloud Foundry? Quite a few. Uh, how many people have deployed Cloud Foundry? So around, I would say, uh, 30 to 40% of the room. So uh, for those of you, you have, who has not used Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry is the de facto platform as a service. Just like OpenStack is the 100% open source component for IIS, Cloud Foundry is similar for the platform as a service. Uh, you take your code to Cloud Foundry, it's smart enough to detect what runtimes you need, what services you need, and as you deploy your application, it will provision those services in the background, bind it to your application, and bring it up and running within minutes. It was established, the foundation was established in December of uh, 2014 under the Linux Foundation umbrella. And just like OpenStack, it has a very strong and vibrant community. More than 60 plus member companies are currently driving the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Uh, so names like IBM, Cisco, HP, Pivotal, uh, Docker, Huawei, Swisscom, they are all participating and deploying their own Cloud Foundry production uh, clouds. I think the interesting thing about the Cloud Foundry Foundation and its membership is that you've got a lot of actual users of the offering as part of the foundation, whereas OpenStack, it's a lot uh, more heavily weighted towards the vendors. So how do we actually deploy Cloud Foundry on OpenStack? We use a tool called Bosch. Bosch is a release deployment as well as lifecycle management tool for Cloud Foundry. It has cloud provider interfaces, or what we use the term internally, CPIs, which bound Cloud Foundry uh, to different IIS infrastructures. So for example, you can take Cloud Foundry, deploy it on OpenStack, AWS, uh, Google's Cloud, as well as VMware. Now, these cloud provider interface methods, they actually use basic OpenStack methods like upload images, provision images, provision volumes, et cetera. How does Bosch work? Bosch actually takes a release, which is a collection of software packages. So for example, MySQL packages, your Cloud Foundry release package, any of the services which you are deploying along with it. It takes all those release packages and then there is this concept of stem cells or base operating system images. Then there is deployment manifest which tells Bosch where we are deploying Cloud Foundry, what credentials we are using, what network uh, we are targeting, what is the authorization authentication information. It takes all that information from deployment manifest and then deploys different VMs and converts it into different Cloud Foundry components on your particular IAS. So here's the first lesson. Bosch, uh, the learning curve for Bosch is that 40% of you who have deployed OpenStack know is incredibly steep, and you're learning a whole new set of terminology and a whole new, uh, really, approach to, to deployment. Um, and so that, that's often the first hurdle, uh, is, is getting folks in the organization comfortable with that new technology. So now let's talk a bit about the problems which we faced uh, while we have been doing Cloud Foundry deployments on OpenStack for now close to two to three years. Uh, as well as the survey which we did uh, last year in terms of finding out the hurdles the community is facing. Uh, instability, when we started, uh, definitely OpenStack um, distributions or the releases which we used to get, they used to be very unstable, as well as uh, there used to be uh, deployments where we have two components from one release, and for example, Cinder and Swift coming from another release, so a combination of these uh, made these OpenStack deployments pretty unstable, as well as led to a lot of API incompatibilities. Uh, 
Also, the plugins which you use, for example, some of the plugins you will use for Neutron, uh, that also leads and changes the API behavior at times. Uh, capacity is one of the things which we have realized. If you don't uh, size it properly, some of the errors which you will get from Cloud Foundry, they will lead you in totally different directions. And you will be debugging things which are not even uh, important at that particular point of time. Network, definitely that's one of the important things. You need to decide, should your management component, should your DEA, should your services, should they co-locate, should they be in different uh, networks, et cetera. OpenStack for enterprise software. Now, this is something for anybody who is building a full platform and deploying things other than Cloud Foundry to support. For example, a lot of services which you might be providing, caching, queuing, uh, et cetera, database services. What we found that a lot of enterprise software it is already mature for VMware. They have these VMware OVA images you bring in, you stand up the software. Uh, but for OpenStack, we found a lot of that was lacking. That's one of the hurdles we faced. Other thing which we definitely wanted to do was this Cloud Foundry plus plus, what we are deploying, we wanted to do it in a generic way so that we can deploy it on OpenStack, on VMware, as well as a software which is our public IS cloud. Combined OpenStack and Cloud Foundry usage. Now, more often than not, when you're actually going in enterprises and deploying Cloud Foundry and OpenStack, the users are not only expected to interact with Cloud Foundry. They want to interact with the same OpenStack on which your Cloud Foundry is running. So you need to make sure you're taking measures so that the workload Cloud Foundry is not impacted uh, by the usage of the OpenStack side by side. <coughs> Cloud Foundry HA. Um, though Bosch is really good, you can increase the number of components, et cetera, uh, do multiple HA deployments. Uh, one of the things which we noticed as we have been doing this is a lot of these databases, et cetera, they're not synced. So if you have a PostgreSQL or a MySQL database under the covers, you have to come up with some additional measures to make sure that if you are doing HA deployment of databases, you are syncing the databases in the background. So from an OpenStack perspective with these first four, I think one of the things that was particularly interesting from, from an OpenStack view is that Bosch, and particularly during a, a Cloud Foundry deployment, really tests the OpenStack API. So it throws a ton of concurrent connections at that API and expects OpenStack to respond uh, very quickly to those requests, uh, as you would expect out of an IaaS. Uh, and particularly in early, earlier versions of OpenStack, uh, a lot of the default configurations would fall over or fail uh, based on that request volume. And so uh, one, of the, one of the pieces that you, we had to pay very close attention to was, was tuning those settings. Because as Anna mentioned, the error, uh, error messages that you get during those failures aren't always clear uh, as to what the, the originating problem is. Uh, proxy or firewalls in customer environments. Now, that's something uh, which we learned as we go. We learned it the hard way that 99% of the customers where we are actually deploying Cloud Foundry, they have proxies or firewalls in place which actually block any outgoing connection. Now, for something like uh, Cloud Foundry, uh, which is a collection of uh, the Cloud Foundry releases, plus a lot of other software which you need to define to support the services, as well as any applications which are being deployed there, they need to reach out, right? So you need to make sure that you are um, architecting this in a way uh, so that Cloud Foundry, as well as the applications which are following, they can be deployed in a seamless way. And last but not the least, uh, the constant release cycles, uh, both CF and OpenStack have frequent releases. More so Cloud Foundry, it has very aggressive release schedule every two to three weeks, right? So how do you maintain actually the patches, updates, upgrades, et cetera, in a consistent manner? For example, one of the problems we faced was as OpenStack was moving towards Mitaka, Cloud Foundry was moving from micro Bosch to Bosch init, right? And we went through a lot of permutations and combinations, and it, you can only find so many, one particular permutation or combination which can stick with that combination, because the community has already moved towards Bosch in it, which was working on Mithaka. And on that last point, I mean, I think this is one of the, the, the key pieces that ultimately led to sort of the, the decision or focus on this as a service model. So in OpenStack, obviously, we have six-month release cycle, which a lot of organizations find to already be a challenge. When then you add on top of that two to three week release, uh, release cycle of, of Cloud Foundry, uh, what we often see is organizations just installing a version and, and leaving it there uh, without ever getting the, the updates in place. And then when you try to go actually finally do that update, when you're skipping multiple versions, uh, there's a lot of associated pain uh, and headache that, that gets involved because those, those upgrades were meant to be done sequentially. Uh, and so 
keeping those environments up to date, whether it be a Cloud Foundry or OpenStack, becomes really critical, particularly when you're trying to, to work uh, with, with both of them in parallel. So uh, from a, a user experience perspective, uh, this survey comes from the we did it as part of the community last year, yep, Cloud Foundry from the community. Cloud Foundry community, yep. Uh, and so the, the question was, uh, what is your level of experience with OpenStack for folks using Cloud Foundry on OpenStack? Um, and in this, this event, most of the, the users were intermediate or, or expert uh, users of OpenStack. So they, they felt like they had a good handle on OpenStack itself. Um, but then what were the, the pain points that they were experiencing with, with OpenStack? Um, and many of them, or, or how much pain, I should say, did they have uh, deploying CF on OpenStack? And the large majority had uh, significant issues with that, with that installation. And other thing is that close to 50% of the users have to actually customize their OpenStack for Cloud Foundry deployment. Uh, so the thought that you can take a vanilla OpenStack install and be able to run Cloud Foundry on it, uh, no, that doesn't hold true. There are certain steps you need to make sure uh, that your OpenStack is ready for a Cloud Foundry deployment. Uh, if you also see uh, the reason most of the users experienced problem was 70% of them said that the instability of the OpenStack has been one of their issues. And more than 50% of the users said that the initial setup, in terms of getting that initial configuration right to get Cloud Foundry and OpenStack, that has been very hard. Uh, most of the users have been uh, on Juno and Kilo at the time we surveyed last year. Uh, so one thing which we notice typically as OpenStack moves to different releases, most of the enterprise users, you'll probably find two releases behind. So they're typically one year running behind uh, the next open source release which is coming. And close to 50% of the users run their own OpenStack rather than getting it from a service provider, uh, services support, or a managed service. But this problem uh, depicted on the left, that, that enterprises are lagging behind on versions, th this uh, by, by far and large is often one of the biggest challenges with that uh, Cloud Foundry OpenStack compatibility component because Cloud Foundry moves so much faster, uh, keeping that, the environments in sync and the, excuse me, the development of Cloud Foundry is done on the latest versions of OpenStack. So keeping that all in sync becomes very key. So with that, uh... Let's just briefly talk about our OpenStack and Cloud Foundry offerings. Uh, the first one is Bluemix Private Cloud. So we renamed Bluebox this week, Bluemix Private Cloud. Uh, it is a OpenStack as a service offering that can be purchased in a dedicated capacity in software or a local capacity in a customer's data center. Uh, IBM manages the full life cycle of the OpenStack installation and its operational uh, capabilities for the user. So the user gets back an API and an SLA. Uh, Bluemix, that's our platform as a service offering. Uh, there are three deployment models. You get a, there is a public Bluemix offering which is available. Then you have dedicated, which is essentially you get your own Bluemix on software, which is our IS, public IS cloud. Or you can get Bluemix in your data centers, uh, which is a private model. Currently on a public platform, we have one million plus registered users, uh, 100,000 plus running applications as well as a catalog of 500 plus services. These include services from our Watson portfolio, a lot of big data services, uh, serverless capabilities, which are provided on top of Bluemix. What essentially is Bluemix? It allows you to build, deploy, and manage your applications while tapping into a large ecosystem of services. Now, these services not only come from IBM, but also from third-party providers, as well as from the open source. Uh, and it's not only a platform to run your applications, it also gives you capability to build your applications. So there are browser-based Eclipse tooling which we provide where you can code in the cloud, run your CI CD from the cloud. Uh, once you click and save your code, it's directly pulled up and then deployed on top of Bluemix. With that, uh, some of the lessons which we learned, uh, we'll go through them. So the first thing which we should do is test if our OpenStack is fit for a Cloud Foundry deployment. Um, there is a link which I've added here where you can actually go and it lists all the manual steps you can take to make sure that OpenStack is currently fit. For example, some of the basic things like can you access OpenStack APIs from within an instance? Can you reach out to the internet from within an instance? Can you come back from outside back into the instance? Can you provision and mount a large volume, et cetera? If you don't want to do it manually, as most of us wouldn't want to do it manually, there is a Cloud Foundry incubator project 
which actually has automated tests, which you can run on top of your OpenStack to test if it is fit. It tests all the basic CPI methods, like creating a VM, deleting a VM, creating a volume, attaching it, et cetera. But apart from that, it also tests a lot of non-functional characteristics. So it checks your API rate limit. Can you take a large invocation of VMs at once? It tests the versions of the OpenStack projects which are required. Will they work with, with this particular Cloud Foundry? It tests all those network connectivities. Can you go outside from a VM? Can VMs ping each other? Can you come from outside in? Uh, so I definitely encourage for anyone uh, who is deploying Cloud Foundry on OpenStack to include this as part of your CI-CD validation to ensure that once your OpenStack is getting handed over, it is fit and it can seamlessly take a Cloud Foundry deployment on top of it. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, sizing is a great uh, big issue uh, which we faced. So make sure that your sizings are correct. There are some links which I've added there, which are public links, which give you some sample sizing configurations to get started with Cloud Foundry. Uh, as you set your quotas in OpenStack, uh, that's very important. A lot of number of times we actually get out of uh, uh, quota errors for number of ports, et cetera. And as again, as I said, some of the times the errors which you see from Cloud Foundry are not exactly telling you that this is a quota issue. She will probably be spending three to four days debugging until you come back to this. Also, the recommended OpenStack disk flavors, uh, they actually go in the ephemeral uh, rather than the root disk when the, you create the flavors. So that's something to keep in mind. We recommend uh, around 10 gig of root disk uh, still. Uh, Another thing, when we started, a lot of the OpenStack environments which we got, the default scheduler, it actually was uh, configured to pack host one by one. Uh, so that means you pack one host machine with the VMs, then you move to the second host, uh, where we found a lot of failures regarding Cloud Foundry deployment. So make sure you are using a scheduler, which actually is distributing the load uh, across so that it can actually take that large number of invocation for the VMs which is coming. And essentially the failures you're seeing there, if it's packing that one host and it's trying to spin up 10 or 12 or 20 VMs all at the same time, you're gonna run into IO contention uh, on that one VM. You're gonna run into timeouts uh, as those VMs take longer and longer to spin up uh, coming back to, to Bosch. Also, you can change the OpenStack settings uh, to configure it for a large number of uh, uh, API calls. As, as Jesse was mentioning, when Bosch actually deploys Cloud Foundry, the whole deployment goes at once. Now, depending on the size of your environment, it could be anywhere between 40 VMs to 200 VMs, uh, which you are invoking at once, apart from the volumes you are provisioning. So make sure that OpenStack is configured to handle those number of API calls. Uh, avoid name-based security groups. What we have seen that it requires activity which is proportional to the message bus as well as the database updates. They are proportional to the number of VMs you are provisioning. So avoid name-based security groups if you can. Uh, if your Neutron is configured with VXLAN or GRE tunnels, make sure you're using the right MQ settings in the cover, under the covers. The other thing which we have noticed, and uh, we kind of uh, stepped onto it, is that one of the environments where we were deploying Cloud Foundry didn't have enough space for, from the root disk. Uh, so the host on which the VMs were landing, they didn't have enough space. So while doing that, we figured out that we can actually configure Bosch and Cloud Foundry to use the block storage instead of the root disk for the VMs. Uh, there's a setting in Bosch which you can actually set. Uh, so that's very handy in case you are running into environments where you want to take some space from the root disk and some form of block storage, et cetera, uh, move around. Also, most of the OpenStack environments are set up to uh, get metadata from the HTTP uh, service. But if your OpenStack is configured to use CD-ROM instead of the HTTP metadata service, make sure that you tell Bosch by deployment uh, that the OpenStack config is coming from a CD-ROM drive. When you deploy uh, Cloud Foundry and Bosch, there is a lots of NATS message burst activity which is happening. Uh, Actually, sometimes you'll see failure when Bosch is not able to ping certain VMs, whether they are up and running. You can actually go into Bosch and change the NAS messaging uh, timeout or ping interval uh, to actually get around it. That's particularly true of the environments where there is heavy load. Uh, at times, you will see the deployments failing just because it's not being able to ping uh, within a certain time frame. Also, uh, for optimizing the round, uh, routing and bandwidth, uh, we suggest putting the Cloud Foundry components, the management plane, 
into its own network as well as the DEAs and the services, they go in their own network. If you are using any supporting services like logging or report generation, uh, make sure that any communication between the VMs which are sending logs as well as your, the component which is uh, accepting logs is happening over the private network. Uh, in some of our environments, uh, the floating IPs or the accessible IPs were used as the target for sending logs. And what happens is it's a round way communication. You're paying twice the cost because the logs are coming from your private network going to the uh, public network, so to say, and then coming back into the private network. So make sure that you are using just one uh, internal network for sending those logs. Uh, some of the common sense things like only open the ports which are needed. Uh, if you are providing credentials in the manifest, which you have to uh, only provide the tenant credentials instead of the full uh, OpenStack cloud admin credentials. If your OpenStack is using a self-signed certificate, you can also configure uh, Bosch uh, to tell it uh, where, what is the self-signed certificate it is using. And then you can, the other thing which we highly recommend is minimizing the number of floating IPs. Conceptually, apart from your incoming device, which if you are using a native Cloud Foundry deployment, that's HA proxy. But in our case, for example, when we are putting a data power in front, or some of the customers when they put an F5 in front, that's the only device which should be on public network. All the Cloud Foundry fabric components should be on your private network behind the firewall. As we mentioned, uh, the other thing which we noticed when we started doing some of these deployments, almost any customer environment we are encountering, there is a proxy or a firewall which is in place. Uh, so in our case, since we take the Cloud Foundry release and package it, the Cloud Foundry release itself was not a problem, but a lot of the other supporting packages which we deploy, or services which we deploy, or runtimes which we deploy, for example, Node.js, they need to reach out to the internet. Because as the deployment is happening, they are downloading some patches or the latest uh, binaries, et cetera. Uh, so we need to make sure that when we are going in a customer environment, we create a list of all these outgoing URLs we are supposed to reach. So we have now a standard set of URLs. Uh, it has been minimized a lot, now only just six URLs which we need, uh, which we hand over to the customer um, to make sure that they are allowed in their pro proxy or the firewall configuration. Some other customers, on the other hand, <clears throat> they become a lot more restrictive than that. So it's not only the outgoing URLs. They also want to know the source IPs of everything uh, which is sending the traffic outside. So in that case, if your VMs have Neutron uh, virtual IPs from the Neutron network, those IPs will not be presented to the external firewall. So make sure that if your VMs don't have any uh, floating IP or a customer accessible IP, then the IP which you are giving is the gateway IP of the Neutron router of, to the admin, the firewall admin, uh, to act as a source. If a VM has an IP from a customer accessible network apart from the virtual IP, then that IP will be presented to the firewall. The other thing, Cloud Foundry doesn't support out-of-the-box SSL inspection. Uh, now, this is a lot of our customers, they actually insert their own <coughs> SSL certs as the packets are coming from outside. Cloud Foundry doesn't support it, so make sure you have that communication with the customer that customers, custom SSL certs won't be supported in this particular case. The other thing which is very important and Jesse will talk about is that we need to make sure our OpenStack updates and upgrades are seamless and they're not affecting the Cloud Foundry experience. So that's one of the key tenets about the, the offering that, that we have and the, uh, the code that we've implemented to do that, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. But uh, as mentioned, there's a release every six months uh, and during that release, we've got to do an upgrade for these customers. Uh, and so being able to do that in a way that doesn't disrupt the Cloud Foundry uh, implementation is, is very important. And then even within, within a release cycle, when there's a security patch or uh, minor releases to the OpenStack services, again, being able to do that uh, without interrupting the, the Cloud Foundry implementation is very important. Um, those, the, the minor releases tend to have a much uh, la uh, smaller impact versus the, the major releases, which obviously have a much larger impact. Uh, and then being able to change configuration variables, so filter, uh, OpenStack filtering preferences, uh, for Nova, those types of, of uh, things, or, or uh, load balancer configurations, be able to do that on the fly for customers, uh, being able to think about how that's going to impact your OpenStack, uh, your Cloud Foundry implementation is important. 
So, I mean, the point here is <clears throat> one thing, one comment which I do want to make is if you see Bosch and Cloud Foundry, uh, that's architected from day one uh, for updates and upgrades. Unfortunately, that has not been the case for OpenStack. Uh, so it's mostly OpenStack is getting into that direction, but we have seen, you know, uh, the updates and upgrades have been a hiccup. So definitely with uh, Blue Box coming into IBM, we saw a 100% improvement on that case because they followed a very disciplined model. And recently, all our Bluemix deployments where we had on top of running on top of Blue Box, they were updated and upgraded without impacting Cloud Foundry even once. Uh, The other lesson, definitely you want to automate everything. Uh, with that, a blue box uses Ursula and Rally, and Jesse can talk about it. How do they actually do that? Yeah, so the, the core differentiation our offering is the operational capabilities. It's not the OpenStack technology itself. And so we actually make the OpenStack code that we use publicly accessible. So if you go to, to the GitHub uh, and you look for blue box group, Ursula is our, our project. And Ursula contains all the Ansible code that we use to deploy uh, and upgrade uh, OpenStack itself. Uh, having this, here, go back to the, the previous one for me. So having, having that set of technology, and that allows us to do uh, both our dedicated and our local installations. So every one of our implementations runs the exact same set of code, all powered by that one automation framework allows us to, to ensure consistency in those environments. And we like to think about it sort of like the iPhone or the Android model. So while we have less flexibility in our deployment uh, in that it is a very opinionated uh, set and of OpenStack technologies and a very opinionated configuration of OpenStack technologies, we know exactly what's on every one of these implementations. And so we know that when we do validation in our lab to go do those upgrades and it works there, that it'll work uh, everywhere else. Uh, this is one of the, the most challenging things that we see when we're acting with customers that, that do OpenStack on their own, particularly with customers that have multiple environments. Uh, ensuring that you've got consistency in, in those configurations between those environments, uh, both from a code perspective and a configuration perspective, becomes really key as you think about ways to, to update OpenStack consistently and ways to ensure that uh, your Cloud Foundry implementation will, will operate across uh, your suite of deployments efficiently. The other thing that we do is we use uh, Rally for uh, validation of the OpenStack environments. Uh, and today we use that predominantly in the lab during our development processes as we're validating each uh, release that we do of, of our product. And we use Rally both to measure uh, performance from, uh, from release to release, and we use it to validate uh, the API and behavior uh, has not changed uh, from the previous release. And Rally has this neat capability where it allows you to track uh, the historical runs uh, from each implementation or from each uh, execution of Rally. And so you can see over time uh, how your, your implementation has changed from performance and a, and a uh, consistency perspective. Um, the other thing which we do once OpenStack is deployed, uh, we use automation under the covers, leveraging the fog gem, which Bosch also uses uh, to do a lot of discovery on the OpenStack environment. So in terms of discovering security credentials, what are the flavors, what are the subnets, uh, security rules, we discover all that information from OpenStack in an automated fashion. And if some of these things don't exist, we actually go ahead and create in the background uh, the security credentials, the key pairs, uh, the different flavors for the DEAs, controller, health manager, et cetera, create the network security rules. And finally, a combination of Bosch and Ruby is used to automate the whole Cloud Foundry deployment on top of OpenStack, be it uploading the stem cell, uploading the Cloud Foundry releases using Bosch, and then finally doing the Cloud Foundry deployment itself. Uh, now, uh, as you see, based on all these lessons learned, and as Jesse has been talking, uh, we decided that it makes sense because of this model, since they require this constant care, uh, there are frequent updates and upgrades needed to offer as a service. Uh, from a Cloud Foundry perspective, you have new release every two to three weeks, uh, but our pause is not only Cloud Foundry, it is a combination of Cloud Foundry plus 150 other services. And if you look at the permutation and combinations which it can create with the versions and mismatches, it can be a huge version in, uh, sprawl. Also, we want to make sure that our public, dedicated, as well as local deployments are in sync. So we follow that cycle where the Bluemix or Bluebox, which we have running in public environment, are dedicated with, are synced with the dedicated and local. Similarly with OpenStack, you have two annual releases, 
And the complexity actually requires expertise in many operational areas. Also, a lot of our users, they want to work with OpenStack uh, and not on top, I mean, not, uh, with op I mean, not on OpenStack in terms of configuring and maintaining it. So with that, uh, Jesse will talk about the IS relay or the box panel component of the Bluemix private cloud. Yeah, and so I, th I think this is particularly interesting for organizations that are thinking about NFV deployments or other organizations that, that have uh, to manage multiple environments. Uh, and if you back up to the AT&T summit at Austin, um, you saw that, that they created their own internal management system to, to handle uh, the complexity of, of having all of those individual installations. So our offering, again, is uh, to provide those individual OpenStack environments to many customers. And so instead of managing one or two OpenStack installations, the, the plan and goal is to manage thousands. And so, again, to do that, we needed a mechanism that allowed us control and automation across that entire platform. And so we've done that with a technology we call Box Panel and a technology we call Relay. Box Panel has become sort of our system of record for all of the data that you need to track a release. So think of every sort of object that's involved in, in an OpenStack deployment, whether it be the data center, the racks, the networks, the switches, the machines, the subnets, the IP addresses, uh, the customers, the, uh, the customer contacts, sort of every little piece or object uh, exists in the system. And it allows us to have a very flexible way uh, to join together data about a deployment uh, in a way that can be modeled out as we do that deployment. And so, if you're thinking about, uh, as an organization, being able to run these types of technologies, think about how you're going to plan for this data. Whether, if you're going to have uh, many installations, you might want to come up with a, a system or a methodology uh, to, to have that in an actual usable point of record. And if it's just a small number of deployments, you can do it in something as simple as Excel. But the key is ensuring that you've got that data recorded so that as you think through the transition uh, of those environments and as you think through the upgrades of those environments, the, the data is consistent. Box, this is, this is a screen that shows uh, sort of the, the user experience that our operators have. So today in our offering, this view is exposed uh, to our users, uh, to our, excuse me, to our operators that are managing all of these clouds uh, and not directly to users. So our goal is to take that headache away from uh, from an individual organization. And so to do that, Box Panel is a central, for us, a central software as a service offering uh, that then talks to what we call a site controller. So again, in dedicated, that's running in SoftLayer, and SoftLayer has 40 plus data centers around the world. So we needed a mechanism within each one of those data centers to control uh, each individual deployment in that data center. And then in the local context, that cloud sits in a customer's premise, so we needed a methodology to actually update and maintain uh, that capability. And our goal with dedicated and with local was, again, to keep the, the code as consistent as possible. So the site controller uh, technology actually sits in a specific geography and can manage multiple environments behind the scenes and talks back to Box Panel to get its instructions. And it handles things like network automation at the site, power distribution automation, uh, all of the monitoring and telemetry. So uh, things like logging, log aggregation and telemetry aggregation go into that one site controller versus coming all the way back to a centralized uh, box panel site. Uh, we found this methodology to work very, very well uh, for managing a multitude of, of deployments. And again, looking at the work that AT&T has done, I think they've, they've done similar uh, implementations. So thinking through, as an organization, how you're going to manage all of those uh, disparate environments that you have becomes uh, particularly important. Uh, so with that, let me talk a bit about the Bluemix relay. Um, as you can see, uh, what you have at the bottom is a customer data center where Bluemix is deployed, or Cloud Foundry is deployed. On the top is the whole backing infrastructure, which is running in IBM, uh, which is uh, managing this remote Bluemix deployment, or the satellite Bluemix deployment, as we call it. Uh, the one key thing, apart from the CI-CD process, which I mentioned, which first transfers the code to the public Bluemix, then to the dedicated Bluemix and software, and finally in customer data centers, uh, there is a technology which we use called Urban Code Deploy. That, in a nutshell, is connected back to a lot of other IBM repositories, as well as some external repositories. So we pull the Cloud Foundry code from an internal IBM repository, plus any other supporting services, so all these IBM software, which is available on Bluemix as a service, for example, our big data suite, our uh, Watson set of services, caching, queuing, all those are available in different repositories in IBM locations across the world. So Urban Code Deploy actually helps us in terms of pulling that code from different repositories, 
creating a single consistent release for a Bluemix deployment and then being able to push out to all these satellite Bluemix locations which are across the world which we have deployed. Uh, so that's one key piece. The other thing is that uh, there is the security piece, what we call internally the curator, uh, which manages these Bluemix deployments in terms of being able to collect logs and generating reports. So who is accessing your environment, uh, how much CPU, et cetera, uh, or triggers are being sent into your environment, is the memory reaching its limit? All that information is collected through the curator console, and reports are generated every day for the customers to see um, what is happening in their environment. The other thing is we also run all the VMs, the Cloud Foundry Components VMs, which are deployed in that environment. They are connected back to an Active Directory server, which is running in IBM, so that every login and logout to those VMs is being tracked and recorded. So apart from the security, the patching and maintenance of the Cloud Foundry VMs itself in terms of the operating system patches or any security vulnerabilities, that's also we, had, uh, we handle remotely from the IBM data center. Uh, this is a view of the Bluemix operations console. Uh, one of the things is it follows, as Jesse was talking about the iPhone model, you get updates, as you can see on the top right, that there is an update pending, and customers can then select what dates or times within a defined period uh, they would want this update to be applied. Uh, so that's how we actually make sure that we are keeping all the satellite, uh, local, private Bluemix deployments in sync across the world by sending these constant updates, and customers can then schedule and provide their dates. The other thing, uh, it also gives a view in terms of the usage of the environment. Apart from the basic IS capabilities like memory, CPU, et cetera, how many users are accessing your Cloud Foundry or Bluemix, how many apps are deployed, how many services are deployed. So it tracks all those other things. Uh, there are a lot of other uh, capabilities within this ops console, for example, in terms of being able to uh, integrate uh, your Cloud Foundry deployment to a customer LDAP, being able to add users from that customer's LDAP, or other things like if you want to do catalog management. For example, if you get a set of services, uh, what plans do you want to expose to certain users? Should they be able to provision those services, or only a subset of users should be able to provision? You can do all that through these operation console. So to wrap up, uh, this is what we offer, Bluemix Private Cloud platform and infrastructure as a service in the data center. Right now, as you can see, there are two different relays operating and managing uh, the IAS as well as the PaaS portions. There are definitely plans and discussions in terms of making this one connection uh, moving forward in the future. Uh, and finally, we want to say that both Cloud Foundry and OpenStack, they are a great fit, 100% uh, open source, strong and vibrant community on both of them, and they really complement each other. Bottom line, it's a match made in heaven. Thanks. Any questions? So the question well, was... How, uh, how close should the OpenStack operators to the Cloud Foundry operators actually work together? How close should the Cloud Foundry and OpenStack operations team work together? Uh, in our case, they're different. Um, so in our model, the entry model is for anyone who is opening up a ticket on the Cloud Foundry side. The Cloud Foundry operator then determines at some point whether it's an issue with the Cloud Foundry itself or the OpenStack. And then they go through the formal channel to the OpenStack to open and say that this is an issue with the open stack. So there are different operations team as of now, not to say that this is the model we want to follow in future. We definitely want to bring them closer together. Uh, the other things which we have noticed is uh, the credentials which you create. Typically when you're deploying Cloud Foundry on open stack, because you need to set quotas, you need to set flavors, you need to give cloud admin credentials or open stack admin credentials to the Cloud Foundry deployer, uh, which is not a right fit, right? If you just give them the tenant credential, then the whole job of being able to set quotas, et cetera, falls on the OpenStack operator. So there is a lot of issues which we are going back and forth. Uh, there is a way within Neutron, though it is not available through the Horizon console, there is a way within Neutron where you can create partial rows. So those rows actually allow you to just be able to create your own tenants, 
create your own flavors, set the quota for that, but you cannot affect any other tenant or any other workload uh, which is running on OpenStack. It's, for some reason, it's not exposed uh, through the OpenStack Horizon UI or CLI, but there is a configuration file which you can prepare and then use that particular role. In mean, my perspective, I'm, I'm a big believer in SLA contracts, and so if you have an agreement with your operations team that's running the OpenStack environment uh, around what they're going to expose and how they're going to expose it, as long as they commit to that contract, then, then you as a Cloud Foundry operator uh, should be able to trust th th that works as expected. And I think it's actually preferable to be able to have those teams uh, be, be split and focus on the specific technology at hand uh, versus trying to, to uh, have two worlds uh, of technology in your head at one time. Your question was, have we grown a, a running virtual network under a Cloud Foundry installation? Uh, you mean the number of different virtual networks or number right, of machines? You're, like, you're talking like subnet size. Fortunately, no, uh, not so far, because as I was mentioning, you know, one of the models which we have followed is uh, the subnet which we create for the Cloud Foundry management control plane is different from the subnet which we create for DEAs or supporting services. So most of the growth uh, which will come, it has to come in the services side. Uh, so the services, they either go in their own tenant uh, on uh, the OpenStack, or if they have to grow and be residing in the same tenant as Bluemix, for example, our logging services, they need to reside in the same tenant where a Cloud Foundry is running. But for that, they use a different network altogether. Uh, so in that case, we, I mean, because our data plane is separate from the management plane, and management plane uh, is predetermined in our case. And we still keep a lot of buffer. We use a slash 24, a slash 23K. Yeah, so the question was, does Cloud Foundry support IPv6 internally? We haven't used Ferran, do you know? No, apparently. Anything else? Great, well, thanks for joining us this afternoon, uh, and have a great rest of your week. Thanks.